Welcome everybody to the webinar series, Ecosystem Restoration, Global Initiatives in Science and Practice. Um, the objective of this webinar series is to provide insight and knowledge about ecological restoration, as well as a way to network and uh, engage with others around the globe. Each month, a different speaker will give a 40 minute presentation with some time for question and answers, um, talk about the regional initiatives, global initiatives, or technical guidance when it comes to restoration. And these webinars are held the third Friday of every month from 12 to 1 uh, UTC minus 4. We aim to grow this every month, so please share um, with your colleagues. So without further ado, I'm going to pass this on to the pre presenters today. We're going to start off with Angela Andrade. She is the chair of the Commission of Eco on Ecosystem Management, and she is also the global policy director for CI Columbia. So uh, over to you, Angela. Thank you very much, Brooke, and welcome to all the participants to this uh, webinar. Uh, well, we, as we all know, we are in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic and the IUCN recognizes that human health depends on ecosystem and planetary health since we are all intrinsically connected. Land use change together with population growth, urbanization and agglomeration uh, processes are key drivers of emerging zoonotic diseases. Climate change, deforestation, habitat fragmentation and expansions of agricultural frontiers increase the contact between humans and other animals, potentially increasing the chances for zoonotic diseases emerging and spreading. Taking all of this into consideration, the IUCN Commission on Ecosystem Management with more than uh, 1,600 volunteer experts has, considered, has consolidated an IGNITE group initially composed by the leaders of some of the thematic groups the, uh, and that will be, will be present in this uh, webinar. Human health and ecosystem management, rewilding ecosystem restoration and ecosystem uh, governance. To initiate a synthesis process of existing information, a better understanding of the complexity of this problem and the connections between the health uh, of the planet, the health of the ecosystems and human health will contribute to construct a comprehensive approach to the One Health vision proposed by the World Health Organization and supported by the Convention on Biological Diversity and reduce future risks to new possible pandemics. This IGNITE group has been very busy discussing what we know and what we do not know about the linkages between human health, biodiversity and ecosystem management particularly from a restoration rewilding perspective. We are starting to build a system approach to better understand the complexity of the socio-ecological process and propose appropriate integrated solutions. We will discuss different scales of biological organizations uh, from population to ecosystems and the policies and governance issues, opportunities we can implement to prevent future occurrences of new outbreaks of zoonotic diseases. At the end, of, uh, we will highlight the potential of using rewilding and restoration as a nature-based solution to address the climate, biodiversity, and human health crisis, which are all connected with other global societal challenges. Today, we will have a series of um, presentations that will be uh, kind of uh, speed talks on elements of the relationship between ecosystems and their management and disease emergence. Uh, to all the participants, please feel free to add any inputs about the model that will be presented on the chat. And at the end, there will be a survey to capture everyone's ideas. I would like to very quickly to introduce these, uh, the members of this group. Well, um, uh, that the, the Ignite group who have been working for the, the last uh, month, I, I would say, months, uh, developing this, this uh, work. So 
Um, you, I want to first to introduce Rene Bayers. He's um, um, Research Associate Department of Zoology, University of British Columbia. Stephen Carver, Senior Lecturer, School of Geography, University of Leeds. He is the current co chair of the IUCN CM Rewilding Somatic Group, together with Ian Convery, who is Professor of Environment and Society from the University of Cumbria. He is a co chair of the Rewilding Somatic Group. We have Adam Eagle, who is the Chief Executive Officer from the Land Lifescape Project. Angie Luis, Professor of Disease Ecology from the University of Montana. Lori Marksack, Scientific Publications Manager from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation from the University of Washington. Karen Nelson, who is Professor of Restoration Ecology from the University of Montana. She is the Chair of the IUCN CM uh, ecosystem Restoration Thematic Group. We have Daryl Smith, who is lecturer from the Center for National Parks Protected Areas, Department of Science and Natural Resources from uh, Outdoor Studies from UK. Celine Suret, who is professor from the Faculty of Sciences, University of Moncton. We have Gerardo Susan, who is professor from the Departamento de Etología y Fauna Silvestre, Facultad de Medicina Veterinaria y Zootecnica, Isotecnia de la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. Liet Basel, who is professor from the Department of Biological Sciences uh, from Brock University, and she is um, the chair of the um, Ecosystem Governance Thematic Group from the Commission on Ecosystem Management. And finally, we have Carlos Zambrana Torrelio, who is Associate Vice President for Conservation and Health from EcoHealth Alliance, and he is the chair of the CM Ecosystem and uh, Human Health and Ecosystem Management uh, thematic group. So uh, I would like to give the floor to the first speaker, who is um, Dr. Angie Luis. So Angie, you have the floor. Thank you, Angela. So I'm gonna walk you through this first part of our conceptual model of how all these different things fit together. So first, we're gonna think about the immediate factors that affect disease emergence so right now, I'm going to ignore anthropogenic change and those kinds of factors. Later in the talk, others will talk about how anthropogenic change and factors can affect all of these different mechanisms, which end up leading to disease emergence. So let's start from the bottom up there at that disease emergence box. So what causes diseases to emerge? Given that there's a pathogen in a wildlife population, what determines whether it will spill over and cause disease in humans? So there are three main factors that determine what we call spillover force of infection. So that's the probability that a pathogen will spill over from animals into humans and lead to disease emergence. So those factors, the first factor is the prevalence of infection in the animal reservoir. So the pathogen needs to be present in the reservoir animal population. And if it's there in a greater, if a greater proportion of the population is infected, then that's gonna increase that chance of spillover. So next comes the reservoir human contact rate. So humans have to come in contact with that reservoir to get transmission, but that could be indirect. So I'm using contact really broadly here and it could be indirect transmission like through a vector like a mosquito or through the environment or potentially through an intermediate host like livestock. And then the last league is the probability of infection given contact. So not every time a human comes into contact with an animal that has an infection does it lead to spillover. So this can depend on a number of things, <clears throat> but one of the main factors is the pathogen and its characteristics. So for example, can that pathogen use human cell receptors? How quickly can it evolve to adapt to humans? So these are characteristics of pathogens that affect whether the pathogen can make that jump to humans. So, so those are the three arrows there that are going into that disease emergence box. So next, let's think about what affects the prevalence of infection in an animal reservoir and the arrows that are going into that. So prevalence of infection in the reservoir is determined by these factors. So first, reservoir host density. For a lot of wildlife diseases, as host population density increases, there's a greater chance of spread within the population. 
So we call this density dependent transmission. And the next arrow, relevant contact rate is important. So if animal behavior changes and individuals contact each other more, then that can increase prevalence. Or for vector-borne diseases like dengue, which is transmitted by mosquitoes, it's the vector abundance and the vector biting rates that are important factors. So we have to think about how is it transmitted and what's the relevant contact. Lastly, the health of individuals can determine the probability of transmission given exposure. So if a stressor is present, it can reduce the overall health of individuals and depress their immune system and make it more likely to get infected if, if they're exposed. So for example, nutritionally stressed little red flying foxes have a higher prevalence of Hendra virus. So those are the factors that feed into prevalence within the reservoir. So what affects now, what affects the contacts between the animal reservoir and humans and what those arrows that are going into that box? So some factors that are important there in determining contact between humans and reservoirs. So again, right now I'm ignoring anthropogenic changes and stressors, things like wildlife trade. Um, those are going to be brought in later into this talk. So, so those things are reservoir host density. So a larger animal population will make contact more likely with humans. So for example, we discovered when we discovered Sinombre hantavirus in the US, it was after an El Nino led to an increase in deer mouse populations, which is the reservoir host. And that led to increased prevalence within deer mice, but also an increased chance of them coming into contact with humans when they went into buildings. So the next, um, so for example, if the disease is vector borne, then the vector density is going to matter. And so if vector density increases, that will increase that indirect contact. So for example, most tick-borne diseases like Lyme disease and tick-borne encephalitis peak in the summer when tick densities are highest. And lastly, reservoir distribution is important. So if a host population distribution expands, there's a greater chance of contact with more humans. So for example, the black rat is an important host for plague, Yersinia pestis, and the bacteria has spread across the globe with its rat host. So those are those, so all of these are the population level factors that affect disease emergence, not yet considering anthropogenic factors. So now Carlos is going to go on to talk about how community level factors tie in. Dr. Carlos Sombrano Torellio is the Associate Vice President for Conservation and Health at EcoHealth Eco Health Alliance and the chair of the IUCM CEM Human Health and Ecosystem Management Thematic Group, and the chair of this IGNITE team. Thank you so much, Angie. Um, and as you described, this is at, uh, all the process that you described is at the population level. So I'm gonna talk about the community level, uh, the, 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 the community of hosts, are, how those are changing, and how that affects all the processes that uh, you described uh, before. So here you have a, a hypothetical example of community uh, of, of, of um, um, and the, the, the most important part is talk about community composition and the concept are around community composition it's around a um, species richness that's the number of species in the community and abundance but also the identity of this and the same thing applies for a, a virus or a pathogen in this case for example um, all of those represent different viral loads or, or, um, or abundance, if you want, of uh, viruses within uh, the host. Some, some species may have high, um, a viral load, like the, the one on top on the right, or them, like the one in the center, they don't, they, they are not, they don't, they don't carry, they are not uh, reservoirs of, um, of, a, of a disease. What I tried to uh, uh, um, show in this, in this was the, the size of the, the, the relative size of the figure also representing abundance. So, once we understand that, that that's how like a, an ideal um, 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 community it's, it's in, in, in nature, then we need to understand the next step, which will be the, how this community, symbol of this community, how this, uh, the, the, the disruption of this community is directly linked to disease emergence. So here I have a couple of examples of how the, this uh, community disassembled uh, works. Uh, essentially, we are asking which species are lost uh, um, from, from the community, and also which is, which species are, are are we gaining? In, for example, from um, let's say from uh, invasive or other species that are more more resilient to, to change. So in the middle, I have uh, some species that have been lost from the original community that are on, on the left side, 
but also we have a new species uh, that comes with uh, viruses or their, their their potential pathogens and these species are uh, um, that we are gaining or we are losing are related to increasing the risk to uh, human um, or to spillover or in some cases um, there's like the um, the effect comes into place where we are gaining more um, resilience into into the community and then reduce at the very end this is a, another an, an, an extreme uh, we have two species uh, uh, that, that uh, the our uh, potential community can have. so we have like higher like this um, um, amplifier um, um, species that are amplifying the, the pathogen but also species that originally didn't have or didn't, were, were, weren't infected or weren't uh, carri carriers of, of, of a pathogen now those because there's more uh, in, um, in con these two species <clears throat> finally I, I, uh, this these two metrics on or, or community composition and species richness are relatively well studied or oh, sorry species regions are well well studied in in the disease ecology uh, literature but all we know that all the other dimensions of biodiversity there are, we're just starting to explore and i have a couple of examples here it's uh, uh, phylogenetic diversity and functional diversity so for example in genetic diversity are we um, the species that are staying behind or the, the ones that are after um, um, they they are they uh, they are staying are more related are those uh, distantly related? <clears throat> or from a functional uh, diversity, for example, we can think about our species that uh, body size, like bigger species, like larger species are staying in, 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 the, in, the, in the community, or like the small ones that are more resilient. So those are things are, that are uh, uh, issues or topics that we are start, starting to understand and that they're uh, are relevant for, for disease emergence. And finally, <clears throat> there's the idea of, of also the, the the, the idea of beta diversity, but beta diversity also the change of, of, of communities in time, over time, and across a, a landscapes that also we need to understand. <clears throat> Finally, these are uh, what, what I described before. This all these things that are related and then directly in competency. So, and those are how we are linking to the population level. So those changes at the community. A level it's affecting community com competency, which in turn it's affecting, for example, reservoir host density or reservoir host immunity, which eventually will lead, potentially lead to disease emergence. Now, the processes of why factors, the drivers that are behind the changes in the community composition are usually anthropogenic activities for like land use and climate change that will be presented now by um, Gerardo Susan, professor at the uh, Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México from the, the Department of... Uh, uh, over to you, Gerardo. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you, Andrew, for your previous presentation. Now I'm going to talk about a little bit in a larger scale. What is happening uh, in, in, in when we introduce and when we see a larger scale, a spatial scale, So here, uh, uh, because we, I will describe a little bit about the ecological integrity and function and the landscape structure, land use changes and diseases. So at the ecosystem level, we see all the nutrient cycles, energy cycles, but also species interactions between them and species interaction with the abiotic factors. Uh, when we increase the, the scale, we increase heterogeneity when we talk about landscape st structure. That's where we have a ecotones, we have changes in habitats, and we have influences of one habitat between other habitats, and these uh, changes increase the species contact rates. That's very important for infectious diseases. So that's also in this uh, atlas, uh, landscape uh, scale where we have developed all human societies, agriculture, cattle, urbanization. So we are increasing this heterogeneity at the beginning and increasing interaction between animals, uh, domestic animals, wildlife, and humans. So the, the way we are structuring the landscape is changing the way animals are going to behave and the interactions are going to occur. So if you have isolated patches and you increase the edge of the uh, areas, you will increase the rates of contact between wildlife, domestic animals, and humans. And also the way we use the land, the matrix, for example, if we have pastures or we have urban places, 
we will have a permeability of, uh, of the uh, movements of the species. So we will have different uh, outcomes when we selected one uh, type of habitat or another. So th that's why several uh, uh, approaches have been trying to understand what are the main drivers for the, the, the main drivers for the for the uh, uh, emerging of diseases, uh, and it, it, most of them have shown that land use changes are the main uh, factor driving infectious diseases occurring worldwide. And this is very important because that's where, where at landscape scale. That's where all these interaction switch, uh, host switch, uh, spillover events occur. So sometimes uh, they are localized, sometimes they become uh, epidemic or episodic. So this is very important. That's why uh, landscape changes, land use changes are, are important for emergence. So as Carlos was mentioned, there are other dimensions of biodiversity. And when we increase the, 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 the scale, we can compare how communities behave and we can understand how the species interact, how the species migrate and how the phylogenetic diversity, the beta diversity and functional diversity can interplay a role in, in spreading or not the infections around the landscape. So that's why it's important to, to show these uh, other dimensions of biodiversity to understand infectious diseases. So this is an example of how phylogenetic diversity uh, relates with the, with, the, with the infection. For example, these are meta-analyses on, on hantaviruses in, in the American continent to figure out how, how the diversity of species of host, uh, uh, of rodents, uh, relate with the prevalence. So the more phylogenetic diversity of is, the lower prevalence is. So, so this is another approach that we have to include into the equation. So this in the landscape, that's where, where all this uh, interface occur, wildlife, domestic and human. So we have developed the whole world, increasing agriculture and, and farming. We have in, increased uh, intensity in farm production. We have uh, reduced the genetic diversity of domestic species. And we have provided a melting pot of, of uh, emergence. So that's where HI1N1 occur and several other episodics that infect animals and humans occur all over the world are in this melting pot. So that's why we have to rethink on, on sustainable soup production, on managed landscape and, and, and other aspects. So uh, that, that's very important to understand this because parasites, uh, bacteria, viruses, prions, and uh, have been reported in this melting pot as a, as a main driver also. And this is finally a, a, an example that I wanted to show you the relation between land use changes, the species distribution, and viral species distribution. So this is important because, uh, for example, in forested areas, we have some species of bats in Mexico uh, and, and, and some species of viruses. If we have another kind of habitat, we will have other species of bats, another species of viruses. And if we have, for example, in the, in the urban sites, we'll have some species of bats and other species of viruses. So if we see this, a, 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 the red circle, that's how we are selecting due to our, our uh, uh, land use changes, selecting species and viruses. So if you see, we, have, we will have some coronaviruses that have been selected because of the land use changes. So we are doing like an artificial selection of, of this. So that's why I wanted to, to resume that uh, sustainable food production, proper way to manage the landscape and the importance to manage not only one place, uh, the, the landscape approach is very important for ecosystem services and to regulate and, 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 and provide services in a regional and, and global scale. And that's why I want to introduce Dr. Lyet Basso, Professor of, and from the Department of Biological Sciences, Brock University, Vice Chair of the UCN CMM in North America and Chair of the Ecosystem Governance Thematic Group in Canada to explain more about the climatic aspects. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, yeah, so climate change we know is going to impact 
a lot of these uh, components that we have been talking about uh, from the beginning. So when we so when we look at climate change, uh, there are first of all the gradual global changes in temperature and precipitation. Uh, and these are just some of the model. Everybody uh, has been seeing them for a while. Uh, but we have to remember also that globally, there are seasonal and geographic variation in what's happening in terms of changes. But this is not the only thing that can affect uh, what we have been talking in terms of disease emergence and how these are interacting also with the land use, with the ecosystem uh, services, et cetera. We have to think also about what we call climate variability, so unpredictable and extreme weather events uh, that can also bring uh, or increase vulnerability uh, in the ecosystem as well as the human population. So when we look at uh, the long-term uh, climate changes and uh, we look at uh, the increased va climate variability as well, we can see that it can affect the different infectious disease risks in terms of warming climate, which cause epidemics or re-emergence of epidemic diseases, uh, especially endemic species. Uh, we have the, like if we look at the Northern Hemisphere, uh, we can see that uh, we can have the increase in terms of introduction of exotic vectors and pathogens. And this is the important part is if you get more vector and you get more pathogens, the two can increase at that point the risk of human population to be in contact with uh, the pathogens. And finally, um, if we look at North America, uh, we know that there's a spread of vector-borne disease and zoonoses. And I'm just thinking about uh, in this region where I live of uh, West Nile virus, for example. So if I take just uh, the case of Canada, for example, uh, this is just giving a bit of an idea of uh, the connection between climate change, but also all the other factors. So for example, uh, trades for, and that we'll be talking, it can be a question, as I said, of changes in temperature, Canada is warming up. So moving from uh, northwards in terms of the vector borne diseases and zoonoses, as well as variability. Uh, and this is one thing to remember is that even within a country or a region, there will be a lot of variation depending on the environmental conditions, depending on land use, uh, depending on biodiversity, et cetera. So this is just to show a very small component of uh, all the, inform the, in the integration of the other component as well uh, in terms of climate change that can uh, impact, and we already know that uh, in terms of species composition, biodiversity loss, uh, so the ecosystem and how it works, so ecosystem services, etc. And that's kind of an indirect link to uh, the host, but climate change can also directly uh, influence the host in terms of ecophysiological capacity of the host to withstand the conditions. If it cannot, at that point, it will have to move so it will have to, to change its range. So there's a question of distribution, density, abundance, et cetera. But also climate change can do the same in terms of the zoonoses or any type of uh, pathogens in terms of changing its, in, its prevalence, uh, in terms of abundance, et cetera. Now, what happens is when we start having new ecosystem because of climate change, biodiversity loss, land use, et cetera, what happened is the host may disappear. And at that point, the, the zoonose may have to select another host. So there's a niche transformation that complicate uh, the, the interaction that we may have. So that can lead to higher level of zoonose, especially when we have a jump from one species to the next and or can reduce if the host disappear and the zoonose cannot jump. So this is quite complex and it will uh, be influenced also not only by the gradual changes, but also by the extreme events. So uh, this is just a couple of uh, graphs from a uh, uh, science paper uh, that just summarize some of the factors, for example, 
So if you look at the upper graph, you can see that in the normal uh, transmission cycle, there would probably be only one transmission, which is the, uh, the blue line. However, with warmer temperature, for example, there may be transmission at a cycle that is going faster. So you may have two peaks at that point during the same, uh, the same year. In terms of uh, climate change, uh, also tolerance uh, of the pathogens. Uh, if, for example, temperature is higher than normal only uh, once, you have the blue line in the bottom graph that it's only one peak. But if the temperature is warmer longer, that means that you may have two peaks at that point of the same zonals. So that increased the incidence of uh, transmission in any type of population. Finally, when we look at uh, the uh, extreme events and human, and human population, uh, climate change variability, such as La Nina, El Nino, but also uh, we can think about uh, typhoon, hurricane, ice, uh, rain, and et cetera, they will bring also uh, changes in the way. And if you're, for, for example, you think about a heat wave, uh, like we had in Europe a few years ago, uh, it increased the susceptibility of the human host uh, in terms of health. And that can bring at that point an increased uh, vulnerability, weakened system, human immune, immune system that can increase the possibility of the host to uh, at that point attack and infect uh, a human. Now we will try to look at that in terms of more global at looking at the legal and regulatory elements. Uh, and I'm glad to present Adam Eagle, who is uh, Executive Director of the Lifescape Project in England. Um, so th thank you very much, Liet. Um, uh, as Liet said, I'm Adam Eagle. I'm the CEO of the Lifescape Project, which is a UK-based rewilding charity. But I also have background um, as my legal, my profession by, by way of background is as a lawyer, um, an international lawyer. And in particular, I've worked in climate change um, litigation, but also in areas of law governing human wildlife interactions more broadly. And you'll see on this first slide the area that's um, circled in red, which points at several of these areas of law which are relevant to the, to the work that we're doing collectively on this project. Um, I should say before I jump in that what I'm about to briefly explore links directly to what Gerardo in particular was speaking about regarding anthropogenic factors um, and stressors. And um, uh, that's subject to only one caveat, which is that, as I'll hopefully get to at the end, that anthropocentric viewpoint needn't necessarily be the case when you're talking about governance um, such as this area. So what we're doing in this space is we're broadly speaking intending to explore the impact of these different areas of regulation and law and um, the impact on emergence of diseases passed from wildlife to humans um, and essentially what that requires us to do is to look at all of the major areas of law which govern human interaction um, and impacts on the natural world and wildlife. So you, you'll see here that I've, I've just given some examples of well-established areas of law which are relevant in most jurisdictions uh, globally. So you've got um, species protections for endangered species or other species, you've got wildlife trade regulation, you've got animal welfare law, you have land use um, change or often talked about as planning law systems, and you've got the, the protection of designated areas, so national parks or nature reserves, that type of um, legal area. And each of those has the potential to impact on the emergence of disease through impacting on various different nodes in the model. Um, now, the key thing to note, I, I think, is that actually most of these areas have, um, in terms of the purpose of their being brought into force, haven't got anything to do with the emergence of disease um, from wildlife human interactions. They're, they're all targeted at different problems regarding human wildlife interactions and not disease emergence, but each of them can still have a significant impact on the, the things that we're talking about today. So um, what I've done here is just pulled out a few examples of where 
there will be significant, potentially significant interactions between the governance um, parts of our model that you've seen on the first slide there and other elements of the model which will then feed into emergence. Um, so I'll, I'll take them um, one at a time. So if we start with anthropogenic stresses, so land use change or and habitat loss. Um, an, an example here is that if, if a jurisdiction, a, a country has strong planning law rules which govern land use change, it, it's there, therefore likely that it's possible to manage land use change's impact on things like community composition and species richness or abundance. And um, you know, those areas of law determine what areas can be subject to significant land use, cha land use change. So um, deforestation, agriculture, fragmentation, um, all things that will be relevant feeding into other aspects of the model. And uh, another example, looking at habitat loss, is that the, the prevalence in a given jurisdiction of uh, designated protected areas like national parks is likely to limit or determine the extent of habitat loss in that jurisdiction and so will, will impact on that area of risk which itself feeds into other elements of the model. Um, taking the second example which is ecological integrity, again planning law or land use change law is likely to impact on elements of this, in particular land, landscape structure, as um, you know, anthropogenic impacts increase and land use change increases. If that's permitted by regulation, then that's going to feed into, again, other elements of the model. Um, and then moving you know, quickly on to the third area there, which is biodiversity. Um, both species richness or abundance and community composition are likely to be impacted on by areas of regulation like the different species that are protected specifically by law in a jurisdiction or globally, um, the regulations that are in place regarding wildlife trade, um, which will impact on that area too, and also even by animal welfare legislation in, in many jurisdictions that covers things like activities like hunting, um, which will directly impact on, on both of those boxes and those nodes in the model. So uh, essentially, just from an initial glance, it, it would seem that the interactions between governance and other areas of the model will be fairly wide ranging. Um, and and you know, I'll leave it there in terms of the specific impacts because of our limited time. So just moving on to another topic, which is likely to be relevant to the strength of the connections between the different nodes in the model. Uh, this slide you'll see shows a existing resource that relates to the rule of law. Now, the rule of law is essentially the concept of um, power being exercised through well-defined and established laws and legal systems. But particularly, it includes the question of whether laws and regulations are fairly and effectively implemented and also enforced by the relevant authority, the government of a given country. And this is very relevant to the strength of connections between different areas of law or different nodes under the governance heading and other nodes in the model, because a country may well have a very comprehensive suite of laws or regulations that govern human wildlife interactions in a way which might, if enforced properly, limit disease emergence. But if the rule of law in that country is very weak, then that might actually be meaningless in the sense that uh, looking at it from the perspective of our model, the connections between those nodes might be very weak because the laws aren't being enforced consistently or effectively. And what you can see on, on this actual slide is, is an existing resource. It looks at the difference in strength um, of the rule of law uh, in different countries, in this case, in Asia, Africa, and Europe. And on the left, it also um, shows the measurement of specifically regulatory enforcement. So this, this aspect of the rule of law, which is most relevant to us in different countries. So one thing that we'll also look at is the rule of law in different countries and how that can impact on the connections in the model. Now, I, I don't have a slide to speak to this very last point that I'll raise before we move on. But there are other things that we'll look at from a governance perspective um, in relation to the model. There is customary or indigenous law, 
which will also be relevant. It will form a node. And that area has got a long history of taking a more biocentric approach to um, human society's relationship with the natural world, much more so than contemporary law. And so that may well be relevant. And a link to that, there is also the more recent phenomenon of legal rights being granted in contemporary law to environmental entities. So, for example, we've seen rivers and other entities like mountains granted legal rights and legal personality. And those two things may well be the paradigm shift that we need to alter the interactions which are being mapped out currently by this model under the status quo and to harness ecological restoration and rewilding alongside governance to limit disease emergence. Um, indeed, that paradigm shift is a core element of the principles on rewilding, which in due course will be published as an output from CEM's rewilding task force and thematic group, which is involved in this endeavor. So th those last parts are far more than we could hope to cover today. So I'll leave it there and for future presentations to cover that aspect of the work. And I'll now hand over to Rene Bayers, who is a research associate in the Department of Zoology at the University of British Columbia. Thank you very much uh, for introducing me. Um, here in this uh, section of the talk, I would like to talk about the, uh, how nature-based solutions may influence um, and mitigate the risk of emerging infectious, uh, emerging, uh, infectious disease. Uh, first of all, nature-based solutions, um, they are a set of actions in ecosystem management that benefit both biodiversity and, and people. Uh, they include uh, protection of uh, uh, nature, sustainable management of ecosystems and ecological restoration and rewilding, which will be the focus of, of this uh, part of the talk. Um, the benefits that we get from nature-based solutions are, are many. Uh, an important one is uh, the use of nature-based solutions to mitigate the effects of climate change. And another one, which we are uh, talk, will talk about, is the uh, effects on a, a potential for improving human health. There are many uh, health benefits uh, that could come from nature-based solutions. Um, and uh, we will focus here, though, mainly on the emerging infectious uh, diseases. I also want to mention that a uh, global uh, gold standard for nature-based solutions is being developed, and that will come out soon. And that nature-based solutions um, are, you know, or can be used as a paradigm shift in the relationship between humans and nature in our culture, in our attitudes and culture, how uh, humans uh, relate to nature, uh, which uh, we think is important uh, across all sectors of uh, society. So, what is the potential of nature-based solutions to decrease the risk of emerging infectious disease? First of all, uh, protection of natural ecosystems. Um, by protecting natural ecosystems, uh, we can maintain the stability of the ecosystem and maintain a barrier between the pathogen reservoirs and humans. As we've seen, is that a breakdown of of, of ecosystems through fragmentation, uh, changes in the diversity of species, etc., can lead to a disease spillover. And um, so we can assume that by um, correcting some of these uh, processes, we can we can uh, mitigate that risk. Um, we can, uh, through ecological restoration of disturbed habitat and biodiversity, we may also uh, hope to be able to mitigate some of the risk and also through the restoration of, of the full uh, trophic uh, cascade in the ecosystem, which I will get to very soon. Uh, what is known about ecological restoration and emerging infectious diseases? Apparently, uh, there's very little that has been published uh, directly on the topic, um, as you can see. Uh, but there has been a, a lot more research on uh, emerging infectious disease in the context of conservation, uh, uh, cons uh, ecosystems, and, and ecology. And the role of ecological factors, as we've seen from the previous speakers, and the role of human disturbance of ecosystems is very well documented. Uh, 
And uh, so this can lead us to uh, have a formulate or have an assumption, make an assumption that the ecological restoration of uh, damaged ecosystems can have susp a substantial impact on the uh, emergence of uh, new diseases. So uh, now we come to the, the model that uh, we have uh, looked at, uh, you know, several parts in, uh, or, or several parts have been looked at uh, by the previous speakers. And uh, you see some circles uh, drawn about some, uh, around some of these uh, elements that uh, nature-based based solutions, in particular ecological restoration and rewilding, could potentially have a, an impact on. Uh, for example, ecosystem structure, but it can go also to habitat loss, to even climate change, etc. Um, I will go into a little bit more detail in the next slide, um, focusing mainly on the trophic cascades, so the food web. Um, uh, in this example, which is uh, a conceptual or theoretical example, but uh, where the, a pathogen host is being controlled by predators in the food pit, and it's also influenced by species diversity. When predators like uh, the uh, bird of prey at the bottom of uh, the diagram disappear from the system, for example, through habitat loss, fragmentation, degradation, um, the host in this case, for example, a rodent is being released from uh, predator control, its population increases, and that may lead, lead to an increase in the risk for disease emergence. Habitat loss, fragmentation, and degradation also uh, can lead to a uh, decline in species diversity, which also uh, may uh, positively, uh, but sometimes negatively, depends really on the species, uh, influence the, the pathogen host. Uh, species diversity is also known to be controlled by uh, predators, and the loss of predators usually has a negative effect on, on diversity. Uh, how can we intervene in the system? Uh, well, on the one hand, through restoring uh, the habitat, um, we can hope to have an impact on uh, the effects of habitat loss and fragmentation. And on the other hand, uh, through uh, rewilding the, uh, the, uh, the food web with uh, keystone species such as predators, uh, we may also have uh, a positive impact on or, or, or try and mitigate the risk of disease spillover. Of course, note that this is a very simplified model. There are several potential interactions uh, uh, left out. Uh, but some uh, disease spillovers, like especially viruses um, from uh, rodents, um, there's some evidence to suggest that, in fact, uh, this model uh, might be valid, but it has been uh, not tested. Uh, another example uh, involves uh, roads. Uh, roads lead to uh, the uh, forest fragmentation what you can see in the picture uh, at the top of the diagram, which benefit a small rodents. Roads also um, act as a barrier for several species, including keystone species that also have, uh, may affect the community through the trophic cascade, which in this example leads to in, uh, an increase in the pathogen host. Um, in, I also included the vector in this uh, example, uh, for example, uh, in this, this case, a tick that transmits uh, Lyme disease from uh, a host uh, to humans. And because of an increase in the abundance of the pathogen host, there is a higher proportion of ticks that is infected, uh, and that poses a higher risk for transmission of the disease to humans. Now, by removing roads, which is part of ecological restoration, uh, we hope we can hope to have a positive impact on uh, this uh, process and the same for ecological restoration uh, to restore the uh, habitat. Um, again, the reality is more complex, but the main point is, as been has said before, that when ecosystems go out of balance, it provides opportunities for spillover of zoonotic disease, 
and there's a lot of potential to mitigate this process with uh, ecological restoration and rewilding. Now I would like to introduce uh, Karen Nelson, who's a professor of restoration ecology at the University of Montana, and who also plays a very active role in SER. Uh, to you, Karen. Thank you so much. Well, we've just heard a series of speed talks that have really highlighted the complex relationships between ecosystems, landscapes, ecosystem management, and diseases. And although we have some knowledge about general relationships, we have only just begun to work on integrating what we know about these relationships into ecosystem management. And with COVID-19 and our current global health crisis, it's of course become really evident of the importance of moving quickly, both to increase understanding of relationships and to figure out how to include risk of disease emergence into our global conservation agenda. And I have just a couple points to make before we move to questions and answers. First relates to standards of practice. I put in the chat links to the developing standards of practice for nature-based solutions, as well as the principles for nature-based solutions, and also also a link and citation for the recently released second edition of the standards of practice and principles for uh, ecological restoration. And what's interesting to note is that in all, uh, in both of these efforts to develop principles and standards, disease emergence is not included at all. Uh, so this is an opportunity for us as we move forward with revisions to our ideas about best practices to be thinking explicitly about how including risk of disease emergence as a problem that we want to solve with nature-based solutions. Now I'd also like to talk about targets. So we have seen amazing global conservation targets that have emerged in recent decades, including the Sustainable Development Goals for 2030. And there is in fact a goal on health. Goal number three is good health and well-being. And of course it explicitly addresses health, but not necessarily disease emergence in terms of its targets. We do I've put up on the, the next slide this uh, image of the page for goal 15, which is life on land. And there is text now within this goal about the importance of conserving life on land to disease emergence. However, when we look at the conservation agenda, what we're planning to do specifically uh, we see that there aren't real targets that are related to some of the interactions that may need to be controlled to limit disease risk. So for an example, for the UN's Convention on Biological Diversity and their agenda for 2030, which is uh, in the works and it's proposing an ambitious agenda, However, in this document, there's no mention, this is the plan, one of the planning documents that I've posted up here, the zero draft for some of you who are working within these themes. It doesn't include disease emergence at all within this draft. And why this is important, because as we are working to achieve global targets, for instance, the really ambitious targets for forest landscape restoration through Initiative 2020 and the Bond Challenge, et cetera, what we do in terms of priorities might change if we have disease emergence and risk of disease emergence as a consideration, as one of the things in the mix in our planning efforts. And I think uh, Renee pointed out some specific linkages, roadedness, for example, that might percolate to the top if we have controlling uh, emergence of diseases or limiting risk as one of our goals. So we showed a model. We um, used our little icons and all the arrows to influence the complexity. 
but basically we have the ecological realm, the economic realm, and the social realm and variables that we need to understand in terms of their relationship with disease emergence and then effective ecosystem management on them. And so with the CEM Ignite team, we are working first to build a conceptual model. And we have a survey for all of you. I'm gonna put it in the chat. I just sent it through the chat right now. We will also send it in a follow-up to everyone who's participated in this webinar to get your ideas of the explicit variables that should be considered in this conceptual model. And then the first, uh, the first step for us, what we've been working on is to evaluate the strength of linkages in the model, what we already know, as well as gaps in understanding. And that can lead us to develop research priorities. So uh, with greater understanding, we will be able to more effectively do conservation in a way that considers human health. And with that, we are really very short on time, but I do see that we have six questions in the chat. And so uh, what I'd like to do is um, I'll go ahead and ask those. I may combine a few of them and suggest a couple of different panelists who might want to answer. Of course, if you need to drop off, um, thank you for participating. Join us next month. We will be featuring restoration in China. And um, let's see, I'm going to launch right into these questions. So first, maybe uh, Gerardo, Carlos, or Angie can address this one. Can eDNA be used as an early warning indicator of potential pathogens in wildlife species? I guess I'll take a stab at that. Um, it's, I've seen very little on that so far. I think it has great potential, but it seem, it's, it's still in development for some things. I'm working with a team that's actually trying to use eDNA technology to um, detect white nose syndrome in the environment. But a lot of these techniques are still in development for like what's the best way to detect, to detect things and in what surfaces, like in water or other types of substrates. So I think there's a lot of potential in the future, but it hasn't made it very far yet. I don't know if Carlos or um, Gerardo want to add to that. So I, I agree with you, Angie. Yeah, same here. There are this the, the, detecting viruses, for example, it's very, very sensitive and it requires a lot of um, um, uh, um, kits or, or primers that needs to be developed. So I think there is a lot of potential. Definitely a lot of potential, but uh, there's uh, the, the the technology is catching up quickly. But uh, but I think it's it's it, it will be a, a great tool in the future. Okay, great. And I'm seeing in the chat some folks indicating they have questions. There's a separate question and answer. So go ahead and type your question into the question and answer, and then I'll be able to see them. Uh, our next question potentially for those same groups of panelists. Um, can we call COVID-19 a spillover effect due to unwise use of biodiversity, or is it due to other global changes such as climate change? Zoonoses of wildlife origin is well known as up to 60% of human diseases are estimated to be from them. Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll let others chime in in a second, but um, really we don't know exactly with this particular disease um, what all the stressors have been. We know there's, it's very likely that, um, that wet markets were important, so there's definitely wildlife trade um, and livestock um, and livestock um, practices as also part of the, especially the contact with human part. But how, where did it come from in the reservoir population, which we think are bats? Um, what are all the stressors that affect it in that population? There's very little we know yet about that. And there's just a lot more we have left to learn. I'll let Carlos maybe chime in. Yeah, no, I agree with you. We, we are learning more and more uh, about that. Uh, but I, I think it's uh, um, the region and the, all the other parts in Wuhan, uh, um, people have been exposed to coronavirus. So there are studies showing that uh, 
there is a percentage of people, like three, as I believe it's three percent, has been in the past few years have been exposed to some type of coronavirus. That's on ongoing, and I, I like to think I, I think it's also related to uh, the the encroachment of biodiversity. It's, you know, like a lot of people going and using the resources and getting in contact with these animals. So um, we are learning more, but there are all the factors that we need to take into account and think about that, including cultural practices that are not happening elsewhere. Great, here's a comment, and I think it's a really important one. Have you considered effects of air pollution on disease? For example, ozone can cause plants, can stress plants causing more mass seed production. Increased acorns could provide white-footed mice with more food and more mice leads to more Lyme's disease. And yes, I think there's uh, many critical pieces that we left out of that basic conceptual model. In an earlier version, we did have uh, abiotic condition, which would have included things like pollution, you know, the, the state of the abiotic part of the environment. And I think that's a critical point to raise. I'm gonna go now to another question. I think this is for our, the rewilders specifically among us. The question is how rewilding of species can help in limiting disease spread and how could we decide about selection of rewilding species? And that's coming from Kashmir. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll take a stab at this. Um, yes, as, as we've seen is that um, rewilding is really in trying to uh, reconstitute the, the, the food web and the biological communities as uh, the, there would have been there in, before a disturbance had happened. And it's the disturbance that um, uh, often leads to the emergence, emergence of a disease. So as I showed in, in, I guess one of the examples is that if we take out uh, an important species, a keystone species that can, uh, through the interactions that this keystone species has, uh, disturb the community and uh, lead to uh, an increase in, for example, a host that carry a, a disease. Now, the question is, I mean, how do we decide which, I think that was the question, and how do we decide which species to rewild? Um, this should be based, uh, I think, on, on, on knowledge of which species should be present in that ecosystem. Um, it wouldn't be wise to uh, reintroduce, for example, a species which does not belong to that ecosystem. Uh, so, and, and we can get that knowledge from um, reference ecosystems, for example, that are still relatively undisturbed and, uh, and look at what species actually should be present and what species have important uh, impacts on the, on the community and help shape the community. And, I think it's also, oh, sorry, Rene, you're still talking. No, 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 go ahead, Steve. Uh, I, think it, I think there's also a, an important spatial element to consider here as well. And, and Rene gave the example of uh, defragmentation by uh, reinstating or removing of roads um, in that, you know, by giving uh, species assemblages uh, uh, space back in their um, original habitats, we're creating that buffer of separation between humans and our activities and, 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 wildlife, and uh, wildlife species and the, um, uh, the disease re potential disease reservoir. So I think there's that spatial element there to consider as well. I think um, just to add to that, uh, there's also a social science element to this in terms of how we look at human nature relations and particularly um, uh, kind of the hearts and minds type of argument in terms of moving from a very much a kind of anthropocentric worldview to a worldview which is uh, more biocentric or ecocentric and uh, appreciates and values the intrinsic value of, of all other species, but also um, the important role of non-living entities within an ecosystem. Um, so I think it, it kind of addresses uh, the social science as well as the, the, the biodiversity and, and, and the, the, the geographical science. Okay, I have a series of questions that I think Adam could help us with answering and, and we can see how your audio quality is. I'm guessing it's, it may be better now. So there's three of them, I'll read them all and then we can do them, you can ask me to read them again. The first is, uh, why doesn't the international community strongly 
limit, regulate, and enforce wilderness trade when their associated impacts, especially in human health, are so clear? Current regulations are proving insufficient. And then a second question said, will bat habitats be destroyed by people scared of viruses as the coronavirus originated from bats? And then another question, based on what we know, can better enforcement on illegal trade on wildlife reduce future pandemics? For example, China has banned consumption of many wildlife animals. Is this the way to go? So those are all related to govern governance and enforcement. Adam, I thought you might like to add some comments. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I'll start with um, why why doesn't the international community strongly limit, regulate, enforce wilderness or wildlife trade? Um, <laughs> that's a very good question. I think it's vested economic interests and um, political reasons why those laws aren't being made and enforced. Um, I think. Uh, a key point probably that I would make on this question is that that the reason we're producing this work that we're working together is to give better useful information to policy and lawmakers so that they can see the the impacts of particular actions and what those could be on the overall picture of disease emergence so I, I suppose I'm, I'm answering by saying the purpose of what we're doing right now which is to give them better environmental information essentially which is something that has to be at the core well theoretically from a legal perspective has to be at the core of lawmaking and um, to use the best available environmental legislation uh, sorry information in in many different jurisdictions and um, but i think yeah answering the question more directly um i think it's you know on a jurisdiction by jurisdiction basis for more specific laws it comes down to the political economic social factors in that country and it's quite difficult to therefore answer current country by country. Uh, I think that what we've just experienced and what we're experiencing now could well catalyze better global regulation, which obviously for an issue like this, an environmental issue, which, you know, is goes over borders, it doesn't respect them whatsoever. Um, hopefully that will give them a kick essentially to, to take action. But it's also for people like us to, to, prompt that action. So, yeah. Um, the, the bat habitat question, um, that's potentially unfair. <laughs> it's very specific. Um, I'm not sure if I'm completely qualified to add some, but I'll, I will anyway. I, I think there's a risk of that. I think this is essentially a social question um, or a cultural question. And maybe Ian or Steve might want to jump in and say something more than I can. I think there's got to be some risk of that, but I wouldn't say I'm particularly qualified to dissect it and answer it from a scientific perspective. Ian, have you got anything on that? Uh, sorry, what was the, what was the bat question again? So the, the, bat, the will bat habitats be destroyed by people scared of viruses or coronavirus, given that that's where it's been shown to originate? Yeah, I mean, it, it, uh, there's, there's potential for that, I guess. And, and particular species tend to occupy a, uh, a certain place in the human psyche and, and bats often are not viewed favorably. So um, I think we need to be, be cautious of that. And as with any, any, any kind of species, it's about providing you know, good information and knowledge that people are better informed. Um, and just moving away from, you know, I, I guess, that kind of more traditional, often superstitious based view of particular species and the role that particular species have. Yeah, and, and that goes right back to what I said in answering the other question, which is that, that we're trying to generate better environmental information for decisions to be made off the back of. So I agree. Um, and then the final one, um, Cara, where, which one was the final one? I'm just scrolling down. It was from Madoff, and he was using the example from China that they've banned consumption of many wild animals, and that may be the better way to go, or a good way to go in terms of dealing with this illegal trade on wildlife issue. Mm. And I think uh, I think that that's essentially something that we're going to be seeking to explore in much greater detail um, as to whether or not putting that input into the model, essentially, um, you, you know, because we could make assumptions as to future scenarios, has a significant impact on emergence um, in particular. And I, I mean, just based on what everyone said here today and background knowledge, I would imagine that that's certainly one of the options. 
Um, but clearly, from what we've heard today, it's th there's a bigger picture and other things like fragmentation of habitat are going to play very significant roles in this as well. So I don't think it's a, a, a you know, silver bullet to deal with the problem, but it certainly could be a useful tool in the kind of regulatory toolbox. No, the, well, oh, Carlos, go ahead. On that, um, two things about first about the, the bad uh, habitat being destroyed because of, of this. First, it's important to remember that uh, SARS, a, a, a coronavirus, too, it's a human virus, and we tend to confuse that uh, the origin of the of the virus with the with the disease that is causing humans. So it's important to remember that. The reason we have this problem is because of human activities, because of how we interact with animals and how we interact with wildlife. Uh, killing bats, it will be the, the work that we can do. Bats provide um, several, many ecosystem services. And I continue to repeat this. If you like tequila, you have to thank bats because they are the main pollinators. That's what I use here in the, in the Americas. But if, you, if I'm in, in Southeast Asia or in Asia, I talk about durian family fruit that people love and there's like millions of dollars that are in the agricultural uh, system that are moved by durian so and then durian it's pollinated by 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 flying foxes by bats so it's important that uh, remember that we depend many ecosystem services depend on on, on bats and the second part on, on the, um, the wildlife trade or the um uh, regulating wildlife trade I think it's context uh, dependent. It depends on each culture, each country. And in China, uh, I believe, uh, this is my, 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 my opinion on this, is that it's wrong to have, a, um, it's not a good idea to have this uh, blanket ban across wildlife trade. This will promote uh, um, this, the, 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 the wildlife trade going into the uh, black markets, underground, where we will have zero control zero biosecurity what we need is better regulation and we need more education to the people can you imagine a big sign in this market september covid19 it was because of wildlife trade or because of this not lack of, 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 of biosecurity that will more into the people than on the people that heads that than just saying like banning no more in wildlife trade we have bad experience with uh, pro by prohibiting things like in the US in the past. So, um, so it's important for me that in the, in, to discuss about this, the context dependency of, of this uh, situation. Many people depend on wildlife trade, the livelihoods, same China versus Africa versus uh, South America. And these markets are happening all the time and many people depend on these markets. Great, great comments. We've seen in many countries the you know, public coming together and making all kinds of changes in order to deal with this global pandemic. And it's been one of the interesting and, and kind of positive things I think we've seen is that people are willing to make changes when there's urgency. And I think too, for the research and practitioner community, we're now highly motivated to deal with issues of disease in our conservation agenda. And so we've all been seeing, you know, this webinar, for example, and a lot of increased energy enthusiasm activity in this area. And so I really appreciate all the panelists taking the time to join today with their thoughts. Angela, uh, on behalf of CEM for initiating the Ignite team, and all the participants for spending a little over an hour with us to go through these themes. I hope that all of this enthusiasm will translate into some real changes for the conservation agenda in you know, the coming years. So thanks everyone. I posted a link to the survey, that's important because we would love to hear your ideas about what should be in this conceptual model of e ecosystems, ecosystem management, and disease. And um, if you have any questions, my email was up at the top of the chat, and I'd be happy to answer them. And we hope we'll see you next month when we talk about ecological restoration initiatives in China. Thank you, and goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye.